I hugged my parents goodbye and left the house, smiling to myself as I silently celebrated the fact that my ruse worked. As far as mom and dad knew, I was heading out for a night of trick-or-treating with my friends. And, well, to be fair, that was mostly true. What my parents didn't know was that my evening was going to include far more tricks than treats. Fairview wasn't exactly known for its excitement and adventure, so my friends and I had to seize every opportunity we could to make a little mischief and liven up the sleepy little town. We would set off fireworks on the 4th of July, send fake love letters on Valentine's Day, and throw water balloons at people around Christmas time. We were the town's tormentors, and the best part was that no one even knew it was us. I mean, sure, they had their theories, but nobody ever managed to come forward with proof. Stirring up trouble was our business, and there was one night a year where business was at an all-time high. Halloween. The sea of costumes practically made us invisible, and the cops were too preoccupied keeping an eye on the little kids to care about what a bunch of teens were up to. We were untouchable on Halloween, and this year, we had plans to raise hell all night long. As I waded through the rising tide of kids in costumes, a word of warning lingered in my mind. Before I left, my father sat me down and gave me that stern, dad look that I had seen countless times before, telling me that people had been going missing around town for the last few weeks. He told me to travel in a group and to keep an eye out for strangers. And of course, he was not amused when I told him that you couldn't tell who was a stranger on Halloween. I had brushed him off at first, but as I passed by mask after mask, a sliver of doubt began to appear in the back of my mind. Someone was making people disappear, and this certainly seemed like the perfect night to catch anyone who happened to slip through the cracks. The sliver of doubt had almost grown large enough to convince me to turn back when I saw Richie. He was standing on the corner of the sidewalk, fidgeting with his hands as he scanned the street for me. As soon as Richie caught sight of me, though, he broke out in a big toothy grin and sent up a full arm wave to get my attention. If he had been wearing red, he would have looked exactly like an inflatable man at a used car lot. But you know, that's what made our ragtag band of rabble-rousers so hard to catch. No one who looked at Richie's gangly frame or my pudgy build would suspect that either of us were capable of doing any real damage. And that was just the way we liked it. So I crossed the street toward Richie, dodging a horde of preschoolers in handmade masks carrying plastic pumpkins. After I joined him on the sidewalk, the two of us set off into a nearby park to meet with the rest of our crew. Tall shadows crept across the ground as we walked, only parting when our flashlights scattered them. Richie and I quickly found ourselves drifting closer together as the creepiness set in. We talked through our plans for the night, about which houses we'd hit first, and which ones were a no-go because... They were too close to one of the crew's homes, and could get them recognized. It was partially a strategy session, and partially a way to distract ourselves from the chill in the air, and the growing feeling that we were being watched. Hellion or not, everybody gets nervous in the woods at night. We were almost at the edge of the park when I heard someone whisper my name. Aiden, a small voice from nowhere called out. I stopped and turned my head slightly, not yet certain that my ears weren't playing tricks on me. Aiden! I heard it again. This time, I whirled around and began frantically scanning the area with my flashlight. What is that? Richie asked, the panic making his voice crack. I think I heard someone whisper my name, man. Ah, I know I did. A bush to the left started to shake, 
and Richie and I simultaneously trained our lights on the spot. I backed into him and the two of us stumbled, falling on our butts as the shaking grew more forceful. Then, a figure emerged from the foliage and into the light. Rachel stood with her forearm raised in front of her, squinting into the light. Hey, morons, maybe turn those lights off and get over here before we get caught, she said before turning and plunging back into the bushes. Richie and I exchanged a quick look of relief before realizing that we were still huddled together on the ground. We got up and dusted ourselves off, mumbling as we did about how it was just a surprise. <laughs> Not being scared, obviously. Then the two of us turned off our flashlights and followed Rachel into the brush. Sticks and leaves scratched at our faces as we moved through the bushes, but we eventually found ourselves in a small clearing, looking down at the rest of our crew. In the moonlight, I could see them clearly. Rachel sat at the end, a semi-popular girl with eyes stuck in a constant state of rolling back. Next to her was Jenny. She was a bookish girl with a devilish knack for making cherry bombs. And then last but not least was Nick. He was the, uh, well, he was the least likely candidate for our little crew. Four of the five of us made sense for the group. I was an overweight kid who just wanted to raise a little hell. Richie was a goody two-shoes who wanted to be bad. Rachel had enough teen rage in her to join any rebel cause. And Jenny wanted an outlet for her explosive hobby. But Nick was different. He was just... Well, he was just a regular guy. He was on the soccer team and did well in school. And he didn't seem to have any issues he was working through or anything. He simply caught us in the middle of a mission one day and decided to join instead of narking. And for whatever reason, he managed to stick around. Richie and I sat down on the grass and the team chatted for a few minutes before getting down to business. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but something was real off about Nick. He was normally a pretty quiet dude, but he had almost nothing to say. Even when we were going over the parts of the plan that he had come up with, at one point, the two of us locked eyes, and I was frozen, just memorized by him. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but the look in his eyes wasn't normal. I shrugged it off as a trick of the light, and I refocused on the planning session. There were four different neighborhoods we wanted to hit before the night was over, and I wanted to make sure I knew my part to a T. The recent disappearances meant that the police presence out on the streets was going to be way bigger than normal. That was where I came in. As the least agile in the group, the position of lookout fell to me. It bothered me at first, to be honest thinking about all the fun everyone else was going to have while they TP houses and stole candy dishes. But I got over it when I started viewing my job as an espionage position. I had to blend into the crowd to survey the enemy, watching and waiting for the perfect moments to strike and escape. At the very least, it made my role feel a little bit more exciting. When we finally wrapped up our meeting, we split up and left the park in small groups. That was rule number one of causing mayhem. You never went anywhere as a complete group. One of the biggest reasons we never got caught was the fact that no one knew that we hung out. I mean, if people saw the five of us together, they would get suspicious. That being said though, we all agreed that it was better to use the buddy system that night given the recent disappearances. Richie, Rachel, and Nick all left together, leaving Jenny and myself. As we made our way toward the first neighborhood, the two of us secretly reached out and held hands once we knew we were alone. It was a, a recent development, and we were still trying to figure it out. 
but I had high hopes that we would kiss by the time New Year's rolled around. I kind of wish that walk had lasted forever, though. But we found ourselves at the agreed-upon street far too quickly. I could still feel her warmth in my hand as she disappeared into the crowd, and I assumed my position at the corner, where I could keep an eye out on the house and the cops. I watched as my friends threw eggs at our math teacher's house, keeping to the shadows and wearing masks as they hurled their hard-shell projectiles. Something still seemed off about Nick, though. He seemed to be more focused on the other three than the task at hand. Between peeks at the police cruiser down the street, I watched as Nick half-heartedly threw a couple of eggs and then hid the carton when the others weren't looking. I didn't have time to process what I had seen, though, because the lights came on in the house and the group scattered. Nick and Rachel ran one way, and Jenny and Richie ran another. I took my cue and nonchalantly walked down the street toward the cop car. I nodded to the officer as I passed, and then cut down the next street to meet up with Jenny and Richie. The three of us got to our rendezvous point and excitedly talked about how successful the first hit had been. We chatted for a few more minutes before the three of us began to wonder where Nick and Rachel were. That strange feeling had begun to creep into the back of my mind again when Rachel rounded the corner and approached us. She was alone. Oh, sorry about that, she said as she joined our circle. Nick wasn't feeling good and decided to go home. I breathed out a heavy sigh of relief when I heard that. I mean, of course he was acting funny. The poor guy just wasn't feeling well. Feeling like a weight was lifted off of my shoulders, I encouraged the group to get a move on. We need to move quickly if we wanted to make up for a man being down. I went with Richie, and Rachel and Jenny went together this time. I was so relieved about Nick that I didn't notice how odd Rachel was acting. Our second target was on the next street over, so we arrived in just a few minutes. I took up my post again as Richie went on ahead to join the girls. This time, it was our gym teacher's turn to get what was coming to him. The group changed up tactics, using toilet paper instead of eggs, so that it was harder to connect the different events around town. This neighborhood was smaller than the last, and the police cruiser was parked way closer to the corner than the other one was, so I spent most of my time keeping an eye out on the cop and trying not to look suspicious. I only knew that it was time to move on when I heard Coach Turnbull shouting from his porch. I sauntered past the officer before making my way down the street to meet up with Richie. The two of us then made our way to the next rendezvous point. We waited on the girls for several minutes. We began to suspect the worst when Jenny came jogging down the street. Richie and I exchanged nervous glances as Jenny came to a stop next to us. Hey guys, sorry that took so long, she said. Rachel remembered her curfew was coming up. I wanted to make sure she got home safely. Well, what about you? I asked, holding myself back from reaching out and taking her hand. You could have gotten hurt coming all the way from her house by yourself. Jenny shrugged off my concerns with a simple, Well, I'm fine, aren't I? And the three of us decided that we would need all hands on deck if we wanted to hit our final target properly. That meant that I was promoted from lookout to saboteur. We also decided that, for safety reasons, we would stay in our group of three for the rest of the night. On our way to the next house, I began to notice that Jenny was acting strangely. She wasn't as quiet as Nick had been, but all of the playfulness and warmth that we normally shared was simply gone. It was almost as if she had forgotten that we had a blossoming relationship. 
I decided to shake it off and focus on the task at hand. We were trying something new and risky. I wanted to make sure we did it right. Now, I'd never used spray paint before we bought our test can in the week leading up to Halloween, and it still felt foreign in my hands. The aerosol spray threatened to give me an asthma attack when I used it, and I was nervous about having a coughing fit during our hit. Still, we were two operatives down, and I needed to step up to the plate. The mission started out smoothly with each of us spelling out our favorite curse words on the side of the principal's house. It went awry, though, when she stepped outside to let her dog go to the bathroom. Caught us red-handed. In her shock, she dropped the dog's leash, and the biggest Rottweiler I had ever seen began chasing me down the street. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Jenny grab Richie, and lead him in the opposite direction. My lungs burned as I gasped out wheezing breaths. The dog was gaining on me as I sprinted away, zigzagging through side streets and alleys on my way to the park. If I could scale the fence that separated the park from the road, then I would be able to safely get to the final rendezvous point. And I just barely made it. I could feel the dog's hot breath on my ankle as I climbed to the top of the fence. Then I watched with exhausted pride as the Rottweiler turned and trotted home. I practically rolled off the fence into the park and I let myself lay down as I caught my breath. Still feeling somewhat winded, I clicked on my flashlight and made my way into the park, looking for the same spot where we had first met up. I then crawled through the bushes and sat alone in the dark, waiting for my best friend and my future girlfriend to arrive. Now, I didn't hear Richie walk through the bushes. In fact, I didn't even see him appear. One second I was alone, and then suddenly, he was right next to me. I jumped back in fright. Where are my friends? I asked, reasonably certain that whatever I was talking to wasn't Richie. It smiled wrong before calmly saying, I think you know, and reaching its hands back behind its head. I watched in horror as it peeled off its skin and revealed its true form to me. It ripped off Richie's face like a mask and exposed the bloody and slimy face behind it. Hell, I took off running deeper into the park, where the trees became dense. I ran behind a tree to hide and I turned back to look, as what used to be Richie was a creature trying to rip off Richie's clothes. It was human, but not. I mean, sure, it walked on two legs and... Sure, it had two arms, but that face was contorted. Those eyes took on a soft glow, and those kneecaps were backwards. I snapped out of it. If I was going to get out of there alive, I would have to outthink it. I mean, obviously I couldn't outrun it. There used to be a bridge with a passageway underneath it. Somewhat like a pipe that went under the bridge. Probably for drainage or something. Richie and I would go hang out there occasionally and look at nudie mags and eat cheese doodles. But in that passage, there's a pit. It's like a four foot circle that drops straight down. No ladder. It was a hell of a drop too. When we first discovered this hideout, this passage... I almost fell right into it. And so, we made a little bridge from some wood that floated down that river, so that we could cross the pit ourselves. That was where I was heading. And so I ran through the trees, the underbrush ripping up my legs, and I occasionally stumbled. I could hear the thing chasing me through the woods. The creature was howling. I looked back once again, and I see this thing is gaining on me. 
those soft glowing eyes bounding through the forest like a deer booking it from a hunter. The bridge came into view, and I made my way under it. I crawled through the passage and I made my way to the pit. I quickly turned on my flashlight and shimmied myself across it. I then turned around and slid the driftwood bridge to my side of the gap, and I turned off the flashlight, patiently waiting. I finally heard the thing climb up to the passage entrance, and I saw its soft glowing eyes staring right at me. It scrambled to me on all fours, but stopped right in front of that damn pit. I started screaming at it, but it just tilted its head. It gurgled and grunted. It thrashed the walls of the passage and threw a damn fit like a five-year-old that was just told it was time to go home from trick-or-treating. And so, I took that can of spray paint, and I chucked it at its ugly-ass face. It took the bait, tried to jump across the pit, but it didn't make it, and it dropped down to God knows where. Now, this is where the police came in. They were actually patrolling the bridge above when I started screaming at the creature. They heard me and decided to investigate. They found the passage eventually, and once that patrolman shined his huge flashlight in the passage and saw me, well, he nearly shit himself. I told him what happened and he just said, Son, it's been one hell of a day for me. Could you just quit fucking around and come out of there? And so I responded to him. Yeah, th that would be great, officer, if it weren't for that thing in the pit right there. Now, he didn't even see the pit at first. But once he did, he shined his flashlight down into it. And he immediately called for backup. The police shot and killed that creature. The following day, some rescue team was called in to retrieve its corpse. Where it ended up, well, I have no idea. But I do know that they did find Richie's remains in the park. It was very gruesome, apparently. The rest of my group, they never did find. It's become some sort of legend or urban myth in my town. A little secret that no one wants to talk about. Small town secret.